All right, this is Mark 9 in the MacArthur Study Bible. There might be a little bit of noise in this video because we got Friday night homecoming at the high school football field, so, so, and the band's playing right now, so I don't know if it's going to get picked up in the video, and when the Panthers get a touchdown, the horn might blast in celebration, so, so, so we might, oh, so there might be some sounds with this. All right, but hopefully a lot of these clothes bags can absorb a lot of it. All right, let's begin. The Transfiguration. All right, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, so, so as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles for you. Yeah, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Yeah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Yeah, that's what Peter said. And then a cloud came and overshadowed them, and then a voice came out from the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one any more, but only Jesus with themselves. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they have seen, until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And then they asked him, saying, Why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many... Yeah, and how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer... Yeah, that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. All right, let's take a look at this section from the Transfiguration. All right, so we open, so this chapter opens with Jesus saying to the disciples, Assuredly, I say to you. Now, this was a solemn statement appearing only in the Gospels, and it was always spoken by Jesus. It introduces topics of most significance. Yep, so really you just need to, so really when you hear that, it's something that you need to pay attention to. Alright, and there's some that are standing here who will not taste death and see, until they see the kingdom of God present with power. And this event had in mind, this yeah, the, the event that Jesus had in mind here has been uh, variously interpreted as his resurrection and ascension and the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost and the spread of Christianity or the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans. But the most accurate interpretation of this, however, is to connect, is to connect Christ's promise with the transfiguration in the context which provided a foretaste of his second coming glory, that all three synoptic gospels place this promise immediately before the transfiguration supports this view, as does the fact that kingdom can refer to royal splendor. So probably in context when Jesus says that some standing here are not going to taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with the power I guess referring to this event of the transfiguration. Yep. 
All right, so after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain. So after six days, yeah, now Mark and Matthew place the transfiguration six days after Jesus' promise that I just read. Now Luke, no doubt including the day the promise was made and the day of the transfiguration itself, it describes the interval as about eight days. So... So that's not a contradiction. Probably, if you put it together, probably maybe between six to eight days. So somewhere, so somewhere around that. All right. Peter, James, and John, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. Yeah, these three were sometimes allowed to witness the events that the other disciples were not, such as this one. They were led up, yeah, led up on a high mountain. Most likely this was Mount Hermon, which was 9,200 feet above sea level. And it was the highest mountain in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, which that was where they were, which is where they were at, yeah, currently in Caesarea Philippi. So probably this was the mountain. All right. Yep, and there goes the horn. Oh, well, I guess that means the panthers are coming out onto the field. All right. But moving on. All right, but Jesus was transfigured before them. Yep, and his clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, so as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Now, transfigured, it means to change in form or to be transformed. In some inexplicable way, Jesus manifested some of his divine glory to the three disciples. Which I guess, you know, with him taking on human flesh, you know, he would be, keep some of his glory concealed. But I guess here he's revealing some of his hidden glory. And once again, this would clearly show that he is the Messiah and he is definitely God, because, I mean, would you ever have a mere man being able to display his glory? Yeah, I don't think so. All right, and the divine glory emanating from Jesus, it made his clothing radiate brilliant white light. Light is often associated with God's visible presence. Yeah, uh, 1 John 5 says God is light. Well, referring to being morally perfect and without sin, there's no darkness at all because it goes on to talk about walking in the light and not in darkness. But anyway. All right. So, white light coming, yeah, coming out of his clothes. So he come ultimately from his which ultimately would be the glory that he's revealing. Yeah, which, you know, whenever sometimes God reveals the glory, you know, it can come forth with light. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But anyway. All right, and then you have the uh, prophets Elijah and Moses there next to him. Now, symbolic of the prophets and the law, the two great divisions of the Old Testament. The order Elijah and then Moses is unique in Mark, who reverses the order in verse 5. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, you know, let us, yeah, and Peter said, you know, let us make three tabernacles for you, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In verse 4, Elijah was written first, yeah, with, yeah, appeared with Moses. I guess to, you know, have that order of law and the prophets in the Old Testament, maybe, I don't know. Yep. All right, and they were talking with Jesus, and the subject that they were talking about was his death. Really? Yep. 
Yeah, so they were talking about the coming death. All right. And then, of course, Peter, you know, says, Rabbi, which means my master. It's a title of esteem and honor given by the Jews to respected teachers. In the New Testament, it's also used of John the Baptist. Yeah, and of course, as I said, Peter said, let us make three tabernacles. So as to make three illustration figures stay, uh, three illustrious figures stay permanent. And it's also possible that Peter's suggestion reflected his belief that the millennial kingdom was about to be inaugurated. In Zechariah fourteen sixteen. Yeah, but he did not. But he did not know what to say. For they were greatly afraid. Yeah, because they're seeing the, some of the glory, so of course they would be afraid. All right. And then a cloud it came and overshadowed them. Now this is the glory cloud, uh, Shekinah. Yeah, which you've heard the expression Shekinah glory, I think. Yeah. But I guess this is where that comes from also. Now, this was throughout the Old Testament. It was symbolic of God's presence. Like in uh, Exodus, whenever God led the uh, children out of children of Israel out of Egypt, he would appear to them as a cloud by day and then a pillar of fire by night. So, in the daytime, you would have this glory cloud. Yeah, the cloud by day guiding them. Yeah, but symbolic of God's presence. And then there's a voice that comes out of the cloud. So this would be God the Father's voice. Yeah, it, yeah this voice cut out, yeah, cut off Peter's fumbling words here. Yep, yeah, the Father said, This is my beloved Son. The Father re repeated the affirmation of his love for the Son first at Jesus' baptism. And the parallel accounts of the Transfiguration also record the, also records these words, as does Peter in Second Peter one, when he actually talks about this event. Yep, and the Father also says, "Hear him, Jesus, the one to whom the law and the prophets pointed." Yeah, and even Moses in Deuteronomy eighteen, yeah, told the people, "There's a prophet." coming that's greater than him so you need to listen to him yep yep and jesus is the one whom the disciples are to listen to and obey yep and us christians today we are to obey the son all right so after all of this jesus yes yeah, so after the father spoke yeah, the, those disciples, the three, they looked around and they didn't see anybody anymore. Yeah, they didn't see Elijah or Moses anymore. They just saw Jesus with themselves. And then they came down from the mountain and Jesus commanded them that they should not tell no one the things that they've seen. All right. So he tells them to tell no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. This looks like to the time when the true nature of Jesus' messianic mission became evident to all that he came to conquer sin and death, not the Romans. Alright, now they kept questioning to themselves what rising from the dead meant. You know, they have no idea. Like most of the Jewish people, the Sadducees being the notable exceptions, the disciples believed in the future resurrection. Yeah, in a future resurrection. Sadducees did not. What confused them was Jesus' implication that his own resurrection was imminent, and thus so was his death. And the disciples' confusion provides further evidence that they still did not understand Jesus' messianic mission. Yeah, just like they didn't get the significance of those miracles, they're still not, you know, getting his mission, ultimately. 
But eventually, when it's all, but eventually, when it's all said and done, they'll finally get it. Yeah. All right, but then they say, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? The scribes' teaching in this case was not; it was not based on rabbinical tradition, but it was based on the Old Testament, specifically in Malachi three one and. 4, 5, which prophesies the coming of Elijah. Malachi's prediction was well known among the Jews of Jesus' day, and the disciples were, no doubt, trying to figure out how to harmonize it with the appearance of Elijah they had just witnessed. And the scribes and the Pharisees also, no doubt, argued that Jesus could not be the Messiah, based on the fact that Elijah had not yet appeared. Confused, the three disciples asked for Jesus for his interpretation of this. Yep, but Jesus said, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. Yeah, so Jesus affirmed the correctness of the you know, scribal interpretation. Yep, so it's true, he is coming first. Yep, so... How Matthew, so how Malachi three one and four five got interpreted, yep, with Elijah coming first before the Messiah, yes. Now this might have puzzled the disciples even more. Okay, well he's coming first, so what does that mean? Yep, and how it is written concerning the son, of, and how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be tempted, and be, sorry, and be treated with contempt? Jesus pointed out that the prophecies about Elijah in no way precluded the suffering and the death of Messiah, for that too was predicted in the Old Testament. Yep, like in Psalm 22. And, then, and also Isaiah 53, probably the most well-known about the suffering, the passage of the suffering of the Messiah, and so on. All right. And then Jesus says, But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it was written of him. So Jesus directly addressed the disciples' question. The prophecies of Elijah coming have been fulfilled in John the Baptist, though certainly not a, recreate, a reincarnation of Elijah. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah and would have fulfilled the prophecies of Malachi and the other Old Testament if they believed, if they had believed. But because they rejected both John the Baptist and Jesus, there will be another one who comes, who will come in the spirit and the power of Elijah before the second coming of Christ. Yep. So. Alright. And then they did to John the Baptist whatever they wished. Jewish leaders rejected John the Baptist. Herod killed him. Yep, as it was written of them. Now, no specific Old Testament prophecies predicted that the Messiah's forerunner would die. Therefore, this statement is best understood as having been fulfilled typically. The fate intended for Elijah in second in First Kings nineteen, whenever Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, it had befallen on John the Baptist. All right, but anyway. There's actually a few notes I noticed that are referenced in Matthew 11:14, so I want to turn there real quick and see what they have to say, because they might shine a little bit more light on this. So let me see if I can find that real quick. All right. But anyway. Oh yeah, and this was whenever John was actually in prison in Matthew 11, and he was wondering if Jesus really was the Messiah. So it was before, so it would be uh, before Herod would ultimately end up 
putting him to death. So. But Jesus sent John's disciples back as eyewitnesses of many miracles. Wait, am I reading the right thing? No, I'm not. I'm looking at verse 4 and 14. But anyway, but Jesus, you know, sends the disciples back to, yeah, back to John. Yeah, and then he actually said there was no one greater than John the Baptist, you know, of, of, of you know, men and women or whatever. All right, oh, here we go, verse 14. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah... Who is to come? He who hear, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, here we go. So he's the fulfillment of Malachi four verses five and six. The Jews were aware that Elijah had not died. Yeah, because you know in Second Kings two, Elijah was taken up into heaven, so he actually did not die. All right, but this does not suggest that. John was Elijah returned. No. In fact, John himself denied that he actually was Elijah. Yeah. John one twenty one. Yet he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. If they believed, John would have been the fulfillment of all the Elijah prophecies. But I guess the reason they didn't see that, they didn't see the fulfillment of John being Elijah, was because they did not believe. Yep, if they believed, they would have seen it. All right, but anyway, that's what we got there. That's what we got. Yep. So. Yep. And, yep, and so, but sadly, he did get martyred. All right, now we move on to the next section. The demon-possessed son is delivered. All right. And I actually got a parody on my channel that Apologetics did of this very passage in Mark 9. Yeah, you should go check it out. Yeah, come on, heal the boy. Come on, heal the boy. First lock the doors. He'll get wild, wild, wild. Wild, wild, wild. Alright, moving on. Alright, I guess the Panthers probably just scored another touchdown, maybe. Awesome. Alright, and when he had came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, and they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? And then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son, who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they could cast it out, but they could not. And he said to him, and he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And then the spirit came out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. 
And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And so he said to them, This kind can only come out by nothing. It, this kind can only come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Okay, let's go unpack this. Alright, so when Jesus came to the disciples, yeah, the other nine that were left behind after the tra uh, transfiguration, so when he and the, those three came back to meet up with the others, yeah, Jesus saw a great multitude around them. Yeah, so you have a, have a crowd, yeah, you have a crowd around them, scribes disputing with them, and then immediately when... He, they saw him, all the people were amazed, and they were running to him. And then he asked, what are you discussing with them? Even though, of course, he knew the answer. Yep. And then one in the crowd answered and said, I have brought to you my son, teacher, who has a mute spirit. So the boy had a demonically induced in, inability to speak. This is only in the Mark, this is only in the Gospel of Mark here, this detail. Of having a mute spirit and then this guy the father you know asked the disciples to cast it out but they were unable to do so so the disciples failure is surprising in light of the power that Jesus granted them previously yep yep and then Jesus says oh you faithless generation uh, this comes from Psalm 95.10. The word generation indicates that Jesus' exasperation, exasperation was not merely with the Father or with the nine disciples, but with the unbelieving scribes, who were no doubt gloating over the disciples' failure to cast out the demon. And he was also pretty upset with unbelieving Israel in general. Yeah, how long would he put up with this? with these unbelievers okay how long would he bear with them bring the son to him yeah bring the boy to me yep and then they brought the boy to Jesus and then the spirit immediately convulses him yeah convulsed him and then he falls on the ground and wallows and foams at the mouth yep so yeah probably the demon is terrified and acting like this Probably because, you know, because the demon recognizes Jesus. So, that might, so that could be the case. Yep, and then he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? Even though, of course, he knew the answer. From childhood. It's often, thro it's often thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So this demon was especially violent and a dangerous one. Open fires and unfenced bodies of water, they were common in first century Israel, providing an ample opportunity for the demon's attempts to destroy the child. And the father's statement added to the pathos of the situation. The boy himself was probably disfigured from the burnt scar from the burn scars and probably further ostracized because of them. And his situation also created a hardship for his family, who would have to watch the boy, and they would have to constantly protect him from harm. Alright, so, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believe. The oldest manuscripts actually omit believe making this phrase, if you can, a question or an exclamation on Jesus' part. The issue was not the lack of Jesus' power, but the lack of the Father's faith. Yeah, if you can do anything. Yeah. So, implying, yeah, having doubts and unbelief. Though Jesus often healed apart from faith, of those involved he also here he chose to emphasize the power of faith he healed many multitudes but many if not but many if not most did not believe in him yet miracles do not lead to faith 
Yep. And then the father says, yeah, he cries out and he says with tears, yeah, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Admitting the imperfection of his faith, mixed as mixed as it was with doubt, the desperate father pleaded with Jesus to help him have a greater faith the Lord demanded of him. Yep. And shouldn't we, you know, ask for the same thing? Yeah, because we definitely are like this father here from a lot of times where we're called to have faith, but yet we find ourselves doubting and not trusting. So shouldn't we call on God to say, help my unbelief and my anxieties and doubts and all that stuff? Yep, I know I need help with that a lot, so. Yep. Yep, help our unbelief, Lord. And when the people saw that, oh sorry, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So noting this growing crowd, Jesus acted without further delay, perhaps to spare the boy and his anguished father any further embarrassment. Also, the, yeah, the Lord did not perform miracles to satisfy thrill seekers. Yeah, he was not a showman. He was not putting on a show for a crowd, no. Jesus' absolute, absolute authority over demons is well attested in the New Testament. Yeah, like in Mark 5 when he cast out demons. Threw them in, yeah, allowed them to go into pigs. And his healings demonstrated his deity by the power over the natural world. His authority over demons demonstrated his deity by the power over the supernatural world. Yeah, he's God. He's got power over natural and supernatural. All right, but he cast out the demon. Well, as the demon was coming out, it convulsed the kid greatly, and then he finally came out. Yep, but after that happened, it looked like the kid was dead, even though he actually wasn't. Yep. And even many thought that he was dead. Yeah, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. All right. And then the disciples, after after all of this happened, they're like, how come we couldn't cast it out? But Jesus said, this kind, it can only come out by nothing, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Some demons are more powerful and obstinate, and thus resistant to being cast out than others. Okay. Yeah, there are some demons that are hard, hard, much harder to deal with. Yeah. Kind of like in Daniel chapter 10, whenever Michael the archangel had to fight against a demon for like three weeks while Daniel was praying. And it seemed like, you know, there was no answer yet. Yeah, but eventually... You know, but eventually, yeah, that would have that was dealt with, and then you would get all those prophecies in Daniel eleven. Mm -hmm. All right, but anyway, but perhaps overconfident from their earlier success, the disciples became enamored with their own gifts, and they neglected to draw upon divine power. So, and yeah. So they probably did not fast and pray, and therefore they weren't able to drive it out. So if they did, then the power that Jesus had given them previously, I think it probably would have been, yeah, probably would have got rid of them, yeah, got rid of the demon. But they just didn't draw on that power in that moment. But I guess they would have with prayer and fasting. Yeah. But ultimately, Jesus himself took care of it. So. so, Jesus is not dependent on other people to do his work for him. He'll do it himself. All right. All right. All right. Jesus foretells his death. And then they departed from there and they passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know about it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being portrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. 
and after he is killed he will rise on the third day. But they did not understand what he was saying. They did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So leaving the region around Caesarea Philippi, the Jesus and the disciples they begin the journey to Jerusalem that would result in his crucifixion several months later. They their immediate destination was Capernaum, which they're about to get to Capernaum. But Jesus continued to speak in seclusion yeah, in, to speak seclusion so that he would so that he could prepare his disciples for his coming death so he did not want anyone to know about this and Jesus continued his teaching about the upcoming death and the resurrection the subject that the disciples still did not understand yeah well eventually they would but not now all right, and then he came to Capernaum, and whenever he was in the house, he asked them, What was it that was disputed amongst yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat them down and called the twelve, and he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and the servant of all. And then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me, the Father. Now John answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name can soon speak afterward evil of me. For whoever's not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because, of you, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Okay, so talking about servanthood here. So they go to Capernaum and they go to that house. Yeah, where Jesus habitually stayed while it was in Capernaum. Whether or not it was Peter's house or, or somebody else's, we don't know. Could have been Peter's, but maybe. I don't know. All right, but Jesus was like, what were you guys disputing on the road? Even though, of course, he knew what they were disputing. But they did not want to answer. Yeah, convicted and embarrassed, the disciples were speechless. Yeah, and maybe that's why he asked them the question. Maybe so they could be convicted of them disputing about who was the greatest. A dispute possibly triggered by the privilege granted by Peter, James, and John to witness the transfiguration. The disciples' quarrel highlights their failure to accept Jesus' explicit teaching on humility. And their example, and the example of his own suffering and death. It it also prompted them to ask Jesus to settle the issue, which he did here, though not as they expected. You know, they would have expected for him to pick one of them to be the greatest. So, yep, yeah. but. And if you desire to be first, you shall be last of all and the servant of all. Yeah, and he sat down when he said this, which rabbis usually sat down to teach. So, if anyone desires to be first, as all of these disciples did, they need to be last of all and a servant of all. The disciples' concept of greatness and leadership drawn from their culture, it needed to be completely reversed. Yep, and even today we still have this same idea that, you know, that the strong and the greatest people are the most powerful and the most famous and so on. I mean, that's how the world defines great uh, great and being the greatest. Yeah, making the most money, having the most women and so on. You know, just all these things that the world idolizes. But that's not what it means to be great. Yep, it means for you to be last in a servant. Not all those who lord their position over others are great in God's kingdom, but it's only those who humbly serve others. 
Yeah, you put yourself last and you put other people first. You're serving other people. Yep, and the ultimate example is what's going to happen to Jesus later on. Yeah, when he dies for his people. Yep, so they could be saved. And the ultimate example of being the greatest in the kingdom. Well, he is the greatest in the kingdom, obviously. Yeah, he's the greatest. Yeah, he's the ultimate example of what it means to be the greatest. Besides, if you're really great, you're not going to think you're great. <laughs> yeah, you're not great if you think you're great. <laughs> All right, and then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. Yep, whoever... Now, this probably could have been an infant or a toddler. If the house they were in was Peter's, this may have been one of Peter's children. I mean, Peter was married because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. And you can't have a mother-in-law if you're not married. All right, but this child became... It became in Jesus' masterful teaching an example of believers who have humbled themselves and become like trusting children, having the faith and humility of a child, yeah, that a child would have. If you receive one of these little children in my name, you receive me. Not actual children, but true believers. You receive children of God, and in Jesus' name you receive Jesus himself. Yeah, kind of like what Jesus said in Matthew 25 whenever he was judging the sheep and the goats. Whenever he said to the sheep, you know, you did all these things to the least of these, he also did it to me. Yep. Whenever you treat God's people with love and humility and all that, and you show, you know, great service to them and even other people that are in need and all that, you actually do it to Jesus. And you receive one one of them, yeah, you receive him, yep. And, and also, you don't just receive Jesus, but you also receive the one who sent him. Yeah, you also receive the Father. So, there you go. Yeah, but of course, doing good deeds is not going to save you, ultimately. No. No. No, it's coming to faith in Jesus and humbling yourself before the Lord that'll save you and then having humility you know having a lifestyle of humility would be evidence of your salvation yep yep that you have received Jesus and ultimately he has received you yep alright but then John answered and said Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. We forbade him because he doesn't follow us. Now, this is the only recorded instance in the Synoptic Gospels where John alone speaks. In light of Jesus' rebuke, John's conscience troubled him about an earlier incident he had been involved in. It's clear that an unnamed exorcist was not a fraud because he actually was casting out demons. And he was apparently a true believer in Jesus. But John and the others opposed him because he was not openly and officially allied, allied with Jesus as they were. But Jesus told them, don't forbid him. For no, one who works mir for no one who works a miracle in my name can come soon afterward and speak evil of me. Yeah, so Jesus ordered them not to hinder the exorcist making the logical point that someone sincerely, sincerely, acting in his name would not soon turn against him. There's no neutral side regarding Jesus. Those who are not against him are on his side, but those by the same token, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Yeah, abroad, Matthew twelve thirty. Yeah, there's no middle ground with Jesus. You're either on his side or you're not. Yeah, if you're not for him, yeah, if you're not for him, then you are against him. If you're not against him, then you're for him. Yep, that's how it works. Even though a lot of us like to play the middle ground, though, but it doesn't work. And it ain't gonna work on Judgment Day. And ultimately, if you play the middle ground, really, you're actually against him. Because if you were for him, you dare would not. You would dare not to play the middle ground. 
So, so really being in the middle means you're actually against. So, yeah, it's all or nothing. Yeah, a hundred percent or zero. All right, but this person who's doing these things in Jesus' name, you know, leave this person alone here. Yeah, yeah. But whoever gives you a cup or water to drink in my name, yeah, belongs to Christ. Yeah, because you belong to Christ, surely I say to you, he who he will by no means lose his reward. That is this person's unique place and service in the eternal heaven. So even though this guy wasn't with them, he was still doing stuff in Jesus' name, still serving Jesus, even though he may not, not have been with the, Jesus and the disciples himself. But he's still doing stuff, and he's still a believer. So, so leave him alone, and uh, he'll have his reward in heaven. All right, and then moving on, warning about hell. Ooh, yep. Yeah, for those who are against hell, Jesus teaches about hell here. He taught more about hell than anybody else. Yeah, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that shall ne never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet yet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. All right, well, that's the end of Mark 9. So let me look at this final section here. All right, so whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to stumble... Yeah, the word translated to stumble, it literally means to cause to fall. Basically to cause someone to sin, cause a believer to sin. To entice, trap, or lead a, behavior in, a believer into sin is very serious. And further, I would add not just believers, but even children in general. Yeah, leading children themselves into sin too. Yep. Yeah, well, especially nowadays where children are being, you know, indoctrinated with LGB stuff, having that be enforced upon them and all that. Yeah, and they don't even have to tell their parents their gender at school. Yeah, they can keep that private. Yeah, it's terrible. And then, of course, the drag queens in, in the story hours. Yeah, it's horrible stuff. Yeah, and then of course the sex trafficking that goes on all over the world that the movie Sound of Freedom addressed. Yeah, causing kids to stumble there. And there's a video I made on this called Don't Stumble Them slash Sound of Freedom where I talk about some of these verses in a little bit more detail. So you can go check that out. But there's something I forgot to mention in that video that I'm going to mention here. As horrible as that is, I would say probably the worst way you can cause not only a child of God, but even children in general, to stumble is to deceive them in the name of Jesus. I would say that's the worst way you can cause someone to stumble. You know, children you know, getting deceived with false teaching, like the prosperity gospel. I actually saw a clip of some teenagers getting deceived with the false gospel from the with the prosperity gospel from this false teacher named Rodney Howard Brown. Yeah, it was just terrible. Yeah, and there was this teenage girl who basically 
applied the sowing and reaping thing that's taught as the prosperity gospel. And basically she was believing God to get a Nintendo. And she applied that, supposedly, and she got the Nintendo. Yeah. And sadly, the kids, those kids like her, they're being taught that this God is going to give them whatever they want if they just have enough faith and if they just sow, sow seed to reap harvest. You can get your selfish desires in the name of Jesus. I mean, that's really what ultimately happens. Yeah, God just exists to give you whatever evil, sinful thing you already want. That's not the gospel. That's a false gospel. And sadly, you got kids that are being indoctrinated into that. Yeah, in the name of Jesus. And I would say it's that. Well, that's not the only false gospel, but I, was, I saw an example of that not too long ago. But I would say it's that. And, of course, even the indoctrination going on in a lot of the schools today with the left. Yeah, but at least they're not doing it in the name of Jesus. These false teachers are doing it in the name of Jesus. They're going to be worse off on Judgment Day than these leftists. Yeah, they're going to get, yeah, they're going to get the probably the hotter part of hell or maybe the hottest part. Yeah, then these non-Christians that are doing these evil things to children. Yeah, these false teachers in, yeah, are going to get worse. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, the pedophile is going to be better off on Judgment Day than the false teacher, than the wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, that caused little children and even children of God to believe in lies. That's the worst way you can cause somebody to stumble. Yeah, it would be better for you to have a millstone in that case, definitely, then you do that. Probably the largest millstone on the planet. It would be better for a false teacher to have the largest one, maybe even a whole mountain tied around their neck than to cause anyone to stumble. Yeah, they should have a whole mountain tied around them and, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, the largest, yeah, the largest, yeah, thing. Yeah, it would be better for that than for what they're going to be getting on Judgment Day with the lies that they told and the people they caused to stumble and go to hell in the name of Jesus. Did all that in the name of Jesus. Yeah, so Rodney Howard Brown and other false teachers like him, yeah, you better repent. Yeah, you're in for it on Judgment Day. You've caused so many people to stumble. Yeah, you caused so many people to stumble with that false prosperity gospel. Yeah, not just... Christians, yeah, even children, even children too. Yep, and yeah, and you guys, if you don't repent, you're going to be worse off than all of these other people. You're going to be worse off than the sex traffickers and the pedophiles and these leftists and drag queens that are indoctrinating the kids. Yeah, or going after the kid. Yeah, so you're going to be yeah, you guys are going to be worse off than them. And I hope they repent too, because they're going to be judged for those sins also. So, yeah. But I won't, But I didn't mention any of that in that other video. But I would say, false spiritual abuse is the worst form of suffering. There is a worst way to cause somebody to stumble. Yeah, telling lies and false prophecies in the name of Jesus. That's the worst thing you can do. And, yep, yep, and the fire is reserved for such people who don't turn from that, so I hope that they do, and that the children of God and even children in general who have been deceived, spiritually abused, uh, spiritually abused, they could be set free with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and I pray for it, amen. I hope that girl in that video and those other kids I got deceived in, in that video, I hope that I hope they get delivered out of that deception. And yeah, that God will save those kids out of there. Yeah. Alright. Amen. So if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to 
in turn to life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. So, Oh, I forgot to read about millstone. It's just an upper large millstone so heavy that it had to be turned by a donkey. Even such a horrifying death, like a Gentile form of execution, this is preferable yeah, to leading a Christian into sin. Yeah. All right, now Jesus' words about if your foot causes you to sin or hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That he's not being literal. This is hyperbole. This is figurative. You're not, we're not supposed to mutilate ourselves. And even if we did, it still wouldn't deal with our sin. Yeah, no amount of self-mutilation can deal with sin. Sin is an issue of the heart. Yeah. And we can't change our heart. Only God can do that. Yeah. And the Lord is emphasizing the seriousness of sin and the need to deal with it, whatever is necessary. Yeah, this is making war against your sin. Yeah, which is what Christians are called to. We're called to be fighting against our... We're called to fight against our sin constantly. Yeah, spirit and the flesh war against each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. All right. It's better for you to enter into life maimed. Now, contrast. Basically, this is referring to eternal life as it gets contrasted with hell. Now, hell, this refers to the Valley of Hinnon near Jerusalem. This was a garbage dump where fires were constantly burned. And this was used as a symbol, a graphic symbol of eternal torment. Yep. So using the Jewish garbage dump where you would have the garbage being lit on fire, just using that as symbolic of the eternal fire and hell that would constantly burn forever. The fire that should never be quenched. Yeah, the punishment of hell is for all eternity. It never stops. It's forever. And this is the unmistakable teaching of Scripture. Very, very clear. Yep, hell is forever. It is real. It is a place of eternal torment. It's the place where God's wrath is exercised against sinners forever and ever. Yeah, and I've actually said this some in private, but I think it's true. Yeah, God is what makes hell hell. Yeah, and also God is what makes heaven heaven. Yeah, the devil's not going to be in charge of hell. He's going to be tortured in hell just like everybody else that's there. Yeah, it's going to happen later on, but he is going, the devil will be tortured in the lake of fire forever. Yeah, hell is not a big party. It's not going to be a party and whatever. The devil's not going to be in charge. No, it's a place of eternal suffering. Yep. Yep, eternal suffering. Yep, for the unrepentant sinners, those who died without Christ. Yep, and a lot of people have issue with the doctrine of hell today. You know, how can a loving God, you know, send people to hell? You know, how could that happen? That, that doesn't seem fair. Yeah, you commit one sin, you're going to get eternal punishment. Are you kidding? Yeah, because we sinned against a thrice holy and eternal God. Yeah. Just like you get a great punishment, like you would go to jail if you shattered a Ferrari, but you probably but you wouldn't go to jail if you shattered a car in a junkyard. But you go to jail if you shatter a Ferrari because of the greater value. How much more so with an eternal God? Yeah, we sin. Yeah, we sinned against an eternal, holy, righteous God, and therefore merits an eternal punishment because of the one that we sinned against problem is we have issue with that because we don't realize how sinful we are by nature we think we're good we don't think we deserve god's justice we don't think we deserve his wrath because we feel that we're not so bad yep yep but that's our problem we don't understand who we are and therefore we think god is unfair with this but no if only we understood who we are i think yeah, we would recognize this is actually good and just. Yeah. And with all this suffering in the world, you know, all this suffering and 
injustice that goes on. I mean, would, I mean, shouldn't there be some form of justice for all of this? Yeah, yeah, we crave justice, but not against us, but against other people. Yep. So, but ultimately, if we realized, you know, how de sinful we really were, you know, we would appreciate the good news and the gospel, and that God provided a way for us to be saved from hell by sending his son. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, without, I mean, God could have, you know, not had that plan of redemption happen. I mean, he could have just not have that in place even before the foundation of the war. Yeah, he could have just, you know, just be like, okay, they sinned, I'm done with them. Yeah, and he would have been perfectly in the right to do that. Yep, but because he's loving, yep, and because he doesn't desire that any should perish, he, yeah, he doesn't want people to go to hell. He made that way possible so that people wouldn't have to. Now, while we were still sinners, while we were on our way to hell, Christ died for us. Yeah, yeah, made that way of escape only through him. Yeah, I mean, I heard the uh, Christians, uh, uh, teacher Justin Peter said say this: as much as we want a savior from hell, we also should want a savior from sin. Yeah, most people want to be saved from hell, but they don't want to be saved from their sin. But Justin said, if you don't, if you want a savior from hell, but not a savior from sin, then you have a savior from neither. Yeah, that's right. People want to escape the consequences of sin, but they don't want to escape sin itself. Yeah, they just want to do... Yeah, because they just want to keep sinning and get away with it. But anyway. Yep, and for those people that have an issue with the doctrine of hell, yeah, just remember Jesus spoke on hell here. Yeah, if you're all about Jesus, you should be all about hell. He spoke on it more than everybody. So, really, you got an issue with hell, then you got an issue with Jesus. So, anyway. Alright. But getting back to it, yep, fire will never be quenched. Your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Yeah, better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes. Yep, and to be cast into hell. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sin better be dealt with. Yeah, now of course trying to be a good person and trying to save yourself from sin, it ain't going to work because your righteousness is filthy rags before God. They're not going to deal with, you can't deal with your sin ultimately. That's why Jesus had to come die on the cross. So for your sins to be dealt with so that you could not suffer the punishment that you deserve because of it. Yep, yeah, and by trusting in him, you'll be saved from the punishment of sin, which is hell. Yep, and then the more you grow in Christ, you'll be saved from the power of sin. The more through the Holy Spirit you fight against it, as you're called to fight against it here, to cut it off. So, all right, but anyway... But everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Now, the meaning of this verse. Now, this. Now, the meaning of the verse is, seems of this difficult verse seems to be that believers are purified through suffering and persecution. The link between salt and fire seems to lie in the Old Testament sacrifices, which were accompanied by salt. Yeah, Leviticus 2.13. And salt is good. Yeah, but if it loses its flavor, how will you season it? Salt was an essential item in the first century Palestine. In a hot climate without refrigeration, salt was the practical means of preserving food. Yeah, keeping food from spoiling. Yep. Yeah, but if you lose the flavor, how will you be... How will you? And how can you be seasoned? Yeah, how will it be seasoned? Yeah. Yeah. If you prove yourself, I think I've heard it interpreted like this from a Christian YouTuber named Alan Parr. 
where, you know, if you are showing of yourself no use for Jesus, then how could, then how can you be used? Yep. But anyway, but have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. And really, you're not going to be in, of any use if you're not dealing, if sin is not being dealt with. You know, God uses those who are, you know, that belong to Jesus, but are also growing in sanctification. They are waging war against their sin. It's those people who prove themselves useful to the kingdom of God. So, so you want to be used by God? Then you need to be through praying that the Lord will help you through the Spirit to fight against your sin. Or if you're not saved, ask Him to forgive you of your sins and lean on Jesus as your only Savior. Yep. Yep. Alright, but have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. The work of the Word. In the Spirit, they produce godly character, enabling a person to act as a preservative in society. Yep. Yep. Through the Word and through the Spirit... We act as a preservative. Yeah, by preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel will lessen, to some extent, the decay of the world. Well, the world is decaying, but the Christians can slow that process down a little bit. Yeah, by, you know, being salt in the world. Yep, and by preaching the gospel. Yep, and showing Christ to other people. And so, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to put away sin and, uh, you know, be an example you know, to the world so, and to uh, shine the light and to spread the gospel so that other people can come to Christ and so they won't eternally stumble. Amen and amen and God bless you all.